Hi, welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith. In this video, we're going to learn the two to eight player game, Sorrow of the Seas, published by Calliope Games. So join me at the table and let's get started. First, you lay out the board and then give each player a ship. I'll set up a two player game in this example. The tiles with these backs are called wakes. You shuffle them into a face down stack and then deal out three to each player. You can examine your own tiles, but you want to keep them a secret from your opponents. I have actually broken the stack into two because I was worried if it was too high, I might knock it over as I wave my hands around. Something you probably don't have to worry about. These are the Daikaiju tiles, fierce monsters that can destroy your ships. Shuffle and place them face down and then take a number to put on the board based on the number of players. With a two to four player game, you're going to use six. With five or six players, place five, and with seven or eight, take four. Now you roll the gold and blue die, once for each die kaiju, matching the blue die to the numbers here and the gold die to the numbers here. The intersection is where a daikaiju tile is placed. But first, randomize the orientation of the tile and then flip it over. If you end up re-rolling the dice and get the same values again, meaning the daikaiju tile would end up in the same space as another one, then just re-roll the dice until you get a new intersecting space. You'll notice around the outside of the board, there are several white dashes. These are the starting marks. So beginning with the oldest player and then continuing clockwise, each person will take their ship and place it onto one of these starting marks, perhaps like this. And that's the setup. In Sorrow of the Seas, you're trying to avoid the Daikaiju, other ships, and being forced off the board. Again, starting with the oldest player and going in clockwise order around the table. Each player will take turns. On your turn, you're considered the active player. And you will perform four steps, starting by rolling the gold and blue die. If their combined result is a six, seven, or eight, then the daikaiju move. On any other result, you just skip to the next step. But we've rolled an eight. Now, to see how they move, you roll a single die. This one result will decide how all the daikaiju move. Simply follow the matching numbered symbol found on each daikaiju tile. They'll either rotate by 90 degrees or move to one adjacent space in a particular direction. So in this example, a die roll of three will force this daikaiju to rotate. And this daikaiju will move one space in this direction. Now that you understand how daikaiju move, let me reset these two tiles because they're actually going to move one after the other in ascending order based on their rotation value. So this is the lowest value at one, but there's also another one over here. In the case of a tie, the tile with a gold rotation arrow will activate first. So remember, our movement value is three. So on this tile, that moves it over here. On this tile, it moves it in this direction. The next highest value daikaiju is this one. A movement of three puts it over here. This one here has a rotation. The three on this tile pushes it up in this direction. And finally, with the highest rotation value, this tile moves there. If you had rolled a six for the movement value, none of them move, but instead draw and add a new daikaiju to the game board using the normal dice placement rules. We're going to look at exactly how daikaiju movement affects the game, but it will make more sense once we understand the rest of the rules. So we'll come back to that in a moment. After the daikaiju have moved, the active player now picks one of the wake tiles in their hand and places it in the empty space in front of their ship. And they can put that tile in any orientation they choose. For example, I might place a tile like this. Now you move your ship by completely following the path or wake your ship is currently touching, and then stopping at the next open space. As the game goes on and more tiles enter the board, it's possible you'll end up connecting to another tile already in play. In that case, you move through that and any other tile along your wake until you reach the first available empty space. If placing a tile puts a path in front of another player, for example, if a player had been here when this tile was placed, then after moving your ship, their ship will move as well to the first available empty space. There are some restrictions to placing tiles. Unless you have no choice, you cannot create a path that would guide your ship off of the game board. Because once you sail off the board, you're eliminated from the game. 
In the same way, unless you have no choice, you cannot create a path or wake that would guide you into a daikaiju. Unlike regular Suro, you can create a path that joins two ships, as long as they're heading in opposite directions. Instead of colliding, they just safely sail past one another. <laughs> of course, safety is a relative term in this game, because this red ship is on a path that takes it off the board, eliminating it from the game. You also can't place a tile that would put you on the same wake path with another player going in the same direction. Finally, you can't place a tile that would put your ship on a path, creating an infinite loop. I've never seen this happen, but it can, so watch out for that, because you would then be eliminated. What I'm really saying is, you can't purposefully play tiles that would cause you to lose the game. Of course, once a certain number of tiles are out, and based on the tiles in your hand, it's likely you'll end up in a situation where you have no choice but to eliminate yourself. When that happens, put any tiles in your hand at the bottom of the wake stack. And as long as there's at least two other players, the game continues. On your turn, although you won't be placing tiles or moving your ship, you will still roll the dice and move the daikaiju as normal. If you're eliminated because of what another player has done, maybe they create a path that joins up to you and then you're forced off the board, like we saw with that red ship. As the loser in that case, you then give your tiles to the player who eliminated you. They get to do a one-for-one -one trade from the tiles they have in their hand to the tiles that you had. So they may decide to swap a couple out that they think would be better for them. Any remaining tiles, they then put at the bottom of the wake stack. But assuming you're not eliminated from the game, you then draw up a number of tiles to bring your hand total back to three, and your turn is over. The next player in clockwise order becomes the active player, and they complete the same four steps. Well, we now really understand the rules of the game, so let's go back and take a look at how Daikaiju movement can affect it. For this example, let's say that Yellow is the active player, and they rolled 4 for the Daikaiju movement. Again, we start with the lowest value Daikaiju, looking at this number on their tile, with gold taking a priority in the case of a tie. If its movement would force it off the board, the Daikaiju is removed from play and put on the bottom of the Daikaiju pile. If it moves to a space with a tile, that tile is returned to the bottom of the wake stack, and if that wake also contained ships, those ships are removed from play as well, and those players are eliminated. We'll ignore for a moment that the yellow ship just won the game and continue with this example. If the Daikaiju moves adjacent to the active player's ship, then that player will not be able to place a wake tile this turn, so he or she would be eliminated. If a non-active ship had also been on this tile, it would be safe, as the Daikaiju may move away before that ship has to place wake tiles. If a Daikaiju moves to a space with another monster, the stationary one is destroyed and goes to the bottom of the Daikaiju pile. It is possible that a Daikaiju may move so that a player can't even take their first move. If this happens, that player may place their ship on any new starting point along the same edge that doesn't already have a tile adjacent to it. After moving, if there are less than two Daikaiju on the board, draw as many as needed to make up the difference, and place them by rolling the dice as before. If this causes the Daikaiju to go on a space with a tile, that tile is removed along with any ships on it, eliminating those players from the game. When there's only one ship remaining on the board, that player is declared the winner and the game is over. Now, if you place a tile and it eliminates all remaining ships at once, then those ships and their players share the victory. And if you manage to fill the entire board with tiles and more than one player still remains, those players share the victory as well. And that's how you play Suro of the Seas. Now, if you want, you can remove the Daikaiju tiles from the game and play traditional Suro with this set. And if you have any questions at all, don't hesitate to put them in the comments below. Thanks for watching.